Welcome Sojourners, this is Jonathan with Sojourners Awake. This is a production entitled The Bookish and the Brave. This is a story of knowledge, dreams, and the understanding of the mysteries of the universe. I think Vaughn, Hawkins, and Sterling are up for quite an adventure. As they accept their mission into Baldtop Library, part of the fun is just getting there. And that's what this episode is all about. Continue to follow along via your favorite podcast system, and if you could, leave a rating and review. And so for now, our story continues. Beyond the protective walls of both the upper and lower city of Boshan, the sojourners pressed onwards toward the Laughing Ghost Inn. Already in the last 24 hours, their worlds had been turned upside down. Vaughn had been working both his position as a noble heir and monk, only to find that his manor, Steeplebottom, had been destroyed and all within by the angry and violent mobs. Only Vaughn escaped with his life, but not before speaking to his dying father and taking up his father's blade. The noble houses, led by the Elithria Elven tribe, had paid with blood for their 80 years of rule here in the city along the Mavi Ocean. In the same day, though guided by the stars, Sterling arrived in the city to the rumblings of discontent and was caught between the Arcanists and a mercantile shop owned by the Slapana House. Making an attempt to help the shop owner, he received missiles one by one to the chest, knocking him unconscious. The smoke of flames and blasts of fire began to suffocate him as he lay there, and without any aid, he fell into his death. His last act upon the earth was to chant a mantra of salvation in the ears of Philena, his attacker. The chalice, the chalice, he muttered. The Arcanists, or someone unknown, wrapped up his body and carried him deep into a dungeon where Starblood, the witch, and Lord Basile performed a ritual determining that Sterling was moving towards Baldtop. Having been convinced that he was the chosen one, Lord Basile smiled and spent the necessary resources to revive Sterling and setting him loose. However, in the moment, Sterling only remembered the blast from the missile in the merchant's shop and then woke up in the wilderness outside Laughing Ghost Inn, where Halif, the druid, found him awakening. Meanwhile, Hawkins plotted with his business partner, partner Fletcher, to provide weapons for the Steeplebottom house, only to be visited by Lord Basile himself. After an unpleasant arrangement with the noble and the crime lord, Hawkins hid Fletcher in the city with a lady named Alexandria. Hawkins then proceeded to leave the city in a late fashion on his way to the Laughing Ghost. But not, so, not too soon did he reconvene with his parents, who provided him with admonishing words and a steel defender to aid his journey. After all, they must protect their investment. It was now here in the Laughing Ghost Inn, an old abandoned stop along the Lion's Road that Vaughn, Sterling, and Hawkins met each other and met Halal, the sage from Baldtop Library. Here in this place, he informs them that he informs them that they are now employed by the Order of the Bookends, dedicated guardians of truth, namely the library. All of this, of course, had been arranged in exchange for their safety, while Boshan burned, while the noble houses fell, and a new order began to grow in the city. And so for now, our story continues. Halal sits down at this table and he begins to explain to you the history of the bookends, Baltop Library, and of course, the current threat to the preservation of knowledge. You see, 
as he sits there with his tea slowly turning cold in the morning light. The rain gently falls again as, is, as it is the season of rain outside. You can hear the windows slowly creaking back and forth as that one hook has broken off due to some rust. Halith in the corner, still washing up the dishes for breakfast. Halal continues on. You see, a very long time ago, Baldtop had to have been established. It was necessary. We had many stowaways, um, fey creatures, gnomes. <laughs> you see, for in the material plane of Bansarel, gnomes were not actually allowed to enter in. They had no way and they had no means of traveling back and forth, and the elves kept quite a tight border in the Feywild. He looks to you, Hawkins, and winks and says, but gnomes have a way of finding loopholes. They have a way of hacking the system. And they're quite curious creatures. Um, living in quite a long time, and I apologize, Hawkins, it is always difficult for me, as a man, to tell the age of gnomes. Do you mind if I ask how old you are? Uh, I don't mind terribly. Um, 59. He sputters his tea. 50. <laughs> you are but a blossom of a creature. Yes, yeah, sir. Oh, well, of course, we share the same age, but you know as well as I, you'll be seeing my great-great-grandchildren if your life does not end soon. Well, anyway, I continue my story. Gnomes banded together in preservation of knowledge, for they saw the rise and falls of civilization, and every time a new order would take over, they would revert to old technology. They would revert to old knowledge and archaic, way, uh, archaic ways. The gnomes of Baldtop began the witnessing program, in which these witnesses stored the information through books, through oral readings and traditions, time after time after time, and preserve that knowledge so that the human kingdoms could survive in this world. And that's what we are experiencing now with Boshan. Boshan is the one of many cities that will fall. It is the time of the uprisings. It is the time of the tilling. And much rot will be revealed and much destruction will happen. The reason we have Bald Top is to preserve the knowledge and the advancements we have made so far here in Bansaro. You know well as anyone that even plane to plane travel is possible thanks to the advancements. To be cast back into the Stone Age would be quite a detriment. He's finished his tea by now and he looks at each of you with a grave and solemn face and he says, there are many who wish to destroy Bald Top. You know this. There are many who would love to see the human races thrown back into starting campfires in the wild with no books, no learning, no understanding of magic and how it works. Curious. In your travels so far, have you encountered such forces that would seek to completely wipe the memory of the races on the plain of Bonsaro? He looks to you, Sterling. Uh, I've not personally witnessed it, but I, I am supposed to be looking out for it. What do you mean? Oh, I just, uh, Oh, I, oh, it's okay now. Um, yeah, preserving knowledge. That, that sounds good. Yeah, no, we can do that. <laughs> Sterling, you are a young man, and I can only assume that, forgive me for saying this, but I am beginning to lose a little bit of faith in you. Might I ask a very awkward question? Please, I'm an open book. 
You aren't using any sort of illusion magic to betray your appearance. No, sir. He is going to judge your honesty and truth. So could you make uh, either a persuasion check or a deception check? They're both an eight. An eight. Okay. You are either trying to persuade him of the truth or deceive him in his questioning. Uh, what can he tell? Um, so he can tell that um, Sterling's a little conflicted, obviously. You know, he's uh, he's still just reeling a little bit left over from kind of not sure what happened earlier. Um, he's not trying to deceive anyone. He's just caught in three minds between um, what he wants to seek, seeking the knowledge and the wisdom and also what he's been told to do. Hollis steps forward and says, it's, I mean, I promise you, I found him lying in the mud. It is quite possible he is not who he says he is. As they begin to bring up this very strong accusation and problem, uh, Vaughn and Hawkins, you have a chance to respond to their, to their, uh, to their insecurity. Well, I, I must confess I do not know him well, but in the moments that we shared last night, he did seem to be genuine and uh, I sense no deceit in him. I cannot speak beyond that, but I am willing to trust that he is who he says he is for now. And as for me, I mean, I don't really know who he says he is or who he seems like, but um, I don't have anything against him. The warm fire begins to dwindle out in the morning light and Halal says to both of you, well, I hope you do trust him because he might literally be the difference between your life and your death. And I am getting serious now, and that is why you are called here. The bookends were established a long time ago to continue the preservation of knowledge, to defend Bald Top Library, and not just defend the library, he stands up, but to defend the truth as we know it in the world. I'm hoping each of you grasp the severity of this. Uh, Vaughn, you, your recommendation came at a high, a very high recommendation. It was not just your family, but Chaffee, who spoke to me and recommended you for this mission. Hawkins, I can't say enough about your family's investment. Oh, yes, I know uh, Quentin and Flavia significantly have financially invested in Baltop Library as well as intellectually invested in this. They chose you for this mission. Though I, I hope that it was not falling upon idle hands, as it were. Oh, excuse me. He stops at a moment, realizing your surname. Halith sets his hand on his brother's shoulder. He looks at Sterling and says, actually, maybe I could help. Sterling. Before you arrived in the muck in the mud, when I found you right outside the inn, what do you remember? Uh, I remember um, uh, going into that shop and like kind of being told to go into that shop. If, if you get what I'm saying, like I, I've seen you changing and moving around. You you you, you do some things too. Um, but yeah, no, I went into that shop and I wasn't quite sure why, but then I was attacked uh, and all hell broke loose and then it kind of goes dark. Do you, do you think you died? I don't, rem all I remember is wishing that I could see the stars and, and then a floating feeling. Oh my gosh. Ah, oh. do you know who brought you to the woods? No, I, I remember a robe and and a smell of something uh, not natural, but no, I don't remember. Halal kind of puts his hand down. I I have to believe that it's there's no way around it. The fate of Baldtop and the preservation of truth are in your hands. 
you are commissioned to go to Bald Top Library. I have these three books for you. He hands, he pushes three books towards you. And they surprisingly have a very interesting appeal to you. These books are priceless, rare, and more importantly, the Bald Top Library does not possess them currently. They are your admittance, for no one can go into Bald Top Library unless they pay the price of admittance with a book the library does not currently own. He pushes the book to each of you, and surprisingly, it has a appeal to your person. Vaughn, what would that book be? Uh, the book is titled uh, Quelsar, Leader of the Lost monastery and as you as you and i know that name because i heard it from from katha earlier and uh, it's maybe legend maybe true but it stems from hundreds of years ago and and qualta seems to be the uh, the monk that we all strive to be he's kind of the uh, he's kind of the guru and so it's it's a book of legend but it's also a book of instruction and so I, uh, I've never seen it. I've only heard stories that uh, that there could be, there could be a uh, a log of his endeavors, and uh, and to see it pop in front of me, my eyes get real wide, and I just I can't I can't believe that it's real, and I almost look over my shoulder to see if Koth is there to show it to him, and then realize that he's not, and uh, and I just humbly humbly nod to hello and uh, and stare at the book. Hawkins, as the book is pressed in your hands, what do we find and how do you respond? The book is, uh, it's called Toys, Trinkets, and Tidbits. It's not a very thick volume, um, but it has in it instructions for making simple things. This isn't, this isn't like a, a grand secret thing they just it just happens to not be owned by the library probably because it's not very important um but you know he is he's been eager his whole life to be able to get into working with uh trinkets and to tinker with things and that's been withheld from him for such a long time that he snatches the book up when he sees the title and like opens it up and basically starts reading right there he like goes to the table of contents and quickly scans down, finds something that interests him and flips to two thirds of the way through the book. And he's just, he's absorbed. And Sterling, what book is pressed up to you and how do you respond? The book's titled Jins and How to Spot Them. And he just doesn't know anything about that. He's just looking at it um, and just, wondering why he was given that one. Haleth looks over your shoulder for a second, Sterling, and says, oh, yeah, I've I've heard of that before. That's quite interesting. Um, those gins, man, they, they kind of appear out of nowhere, disguising themselves as one of us, and he kind of nudges you on the shoulder. Yeah, yeah one of us. Halal says, you have your admittance. I, at this point, have done my duty to Bald Top. I have recruited you. You will be working at Bald Top for some time until you prove your worth. Uh, sometimes that can take months. In rare cases, it can even take years. But as, as you are pulled out of Boshan, for it is quite clear that each of your lives were on the line, I hope you repay bald top as a bookend to the best of your ability for the sake of truth i go now to boshan for i have many clients that i need to wrap up loose ends Haleth will guide you to bald top as soon as you are ready though i suggest you make as much haste and as he turns towards the door as he's getting ready to leave he says and do not lose your book that would not be a great way to start your business. 
As he's leaving, how are each of you responding around the room? What are you paying attention to? Hawkins barely looks up. Vaughn was looking around the room and he noticed how excited Hawkins was for his book and he knew how excited he was for his book. And he uh, he noticed that Sterling was not excited about the gin book and then made that very awkward comment mm. when Halal asked him about it. And uh, so he's kind of got a side eye on Sterling. He's not 100% sure what to think. And so he's that's kind of that's kind of where he's at is he's he's reading the room and trying to figure out you know the the brothers were a little bit concerned and and then Sterling said some goofy stuff and now he's he's just uh he's not 100% confident so he's keeping an eye on him Halal moves towards the door door is closed Hollis takes a deep sigh of relief and says, I apologize for my brother. He is very well intended, but he can be incredibly serious about the goings on of the world. He takes his job very seriously and to be quite honest, doesn't like it when re recruitments look bad upon his reputation. He's got a good heart though. He's pulled up a chair side, by, uh, side to you guys and sits down and says, so you like the books, huh? Hawkins nods. You will um, have a couple of days to read them because it does take a couple of days to take the path to Bald Top Library from here. I gotta warn you, the wilderness is pretty dangerous and we not many people travel along these roads. Um, so I have my ways of blending into the wild, um, as you have seen. Uh, Hawkins, I'm able to transform into various animals at certain times. But um, I'm hoping each of you have come well prepared to defend yourselves in the case that, uh, you know, the occasional predator, bandits, uh, portal to the abyss, oh, all kinds of things can happen in the wild. You never know. Um, uh, are you the type to turn and flee? I mean, I don't even know if you guys know each other. We are meeting each other now, but uh, uh, I, I am not the not type to turn and flee. No, that's good. Did I mention? Did I, I, I remember fighting back before everything happened. Fair enough. <clears throat> and, uh, well, Hawkins, I saw you have a, quite a powerful animal back there. I um, suppose that thing could get you out of a pickle if you needed. Yeah, I'm still learning how to control it real well, but, um, yeah, oh, I think it could, I think it could help me get out of a situation. Well, good enough. I honestly am in not really much of a hurry. Um, yeah. We could afford a time. The Laughing Ghost Inn is open. Um, there's, uh, we could stay here for as long as you want and head out um, getting to Bald Top as soon as possible. I understand they're not really expecting you any time soon, but as long as you have your books, you'll be admitted. If you don't mind, I'd like to, to finish up this section that I'm reading here at least. Um, uh, I'd really like to read the whole book before we get on the road. It's not not terribly easy to read while we're traveling. Yeah, like I said, take your time. He looks to each of you, Sterling, Vaughn. Sterling, you can see him um, wrapping it in paper and then taking out like a fish kind of skin and waterproofing it and wrapping it tight and just throwing it in his bag. He, he doesn't know quite what to take of it, um, but he wants to protect it. That's a neat little trick. What you doing there? Oh, just uh, weatherproofing it, you know, making sure that nothing happens to it. And how well said that this is our admission. So it seems like I must keep it safe. And I, I like water, so if it, I don't want it to get wet. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I mean, I'm not as caring as my brother and everything, but I mean, don't get me wrong. You don't seem like the kind that really likes to read too much. I'm really surprised they chose you for Bald Top. <laughs> I've done plenty of reading in my time. Yeah, I, I, I do. I do a bit of reading just, you know, when I'm, when I'm called to. Um, just, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'm just, I don't know what a gin is. You said they, they look like regular people. You don't know what a gin is? Uh, not come across it in my studies. Well, okay. I mean, 
a jinn, they're usually like the overlords of the elemental planes. You know, pretty much old stuff that pretty much formed all the worlds, the four elements and all that stuff. You know, they the gods had to kind of put them away because they got carried away. But every once in a while, one of them sneaks into the plane and maybe has a good time, goes to a little gambling, a little casino, you know, uh, maybe makes a friend. <laughs> they have uh, been known to walk the earth. Didn't your parents ever tell you the story of the three gins and the lady? Uh, no. No, they didn't. I'm sorry. I, I mean, if I heard that, well, anyways. Me but, hey, maybe we'll walk in. You can tell me about it. I'd, I'd like to hear it. I'll, I'll see if I can remember it. It's been, well, quite a while since, since I heard it last, but I can probably remember enough of it. Well, like I said, you got plenty of time. Um, I, I got a couple things that I'm going to pack. I'll leave y'all to it. Um, and to be quite honest, if any of you skirt while I'm gone, I won't take it personal. <laughs> anyway, uh, I left my stuff upstairs. And you see now that the library has, or sorry, the, um, the inn has six bedrooms upstairs, a small little dining meeting area downstairs with a fire and a kitchen, place to hang your coats. Everything's in pretty condemned condition. It has that musty smell of not being occupied for years. And the door on the outside of the window continues to creak back and forth as the wind picks up and the rain begins to fall hard. You all have a moment here. It's daytime and it's raining, correct? Okay, Vaughn is going to, uh, once the room is clear and it's just the three of us, Vaughn is going to look at Hawkins and Sterling and say, I will return my book to my room and then I will be leaving for a while. But be sure that I will return. And he's just going to get up and go. Uh, okay. Um, let us know if you need anything, I guess. Or how, how long are you going to be gone? Should we... When should we start packing up? Well, he said that we have a couple days. I don't expect to be gone for more than a couple hours. All right. If you don't see me in the next four hours, then you can either move on without me or you can come to the upper city, uh, to the old steeple bottom manor and look for me there. All right, I know where that is. Vaughn's going to leave. All right. Vaughn, you leave and it's completely raining, uh, pouring down really hard. And it's a pretty long march all the way back to Steeple Bottom. Luckily, due to the rain as you enter into the city, the fires have all been put out. There are not many people on the streets, and those that are on the streets are hooded and cloaked. You're blending right into the city. He's going to move fast. He's going to move in the shadows as much as he can. And he's going to take all the back passages and dark uh, street sides to get to Steeple Bottom Manor. When you arrive at Steeple Bottom Manor, it is completely abandoned. You see evidence of furniture knocked over, the doors have been burned to a crisp, kicked open, windows have been broken. Um, you see the sad remains of an attendant lying dead on the stairway as they fled, an arrow notched in their shoulder. A man, you knew him, he worked here at the Steeple Bottom Manor. You'd seen him once or twice. He lies there. Fawn is going to... Uh walk over to him, uh, make sure that he, uh, confirm that he is passed. And if he confirms that he is dead, he's going to rip the arrow out of his shoulder and uh, cross his arms, cross his chest. And he's going to, he's going to then peek out the back and see if, uh, if there is anyone in the back area, if he, or if he could have some time in, in the backyard for lack of a better term, mm. uh, to dig a shallow grave. It takes you some time, but you 
lift the poor man up. You drag him back to the the backyard, and there's pl- there's a spade lying there, abandoned. Um, you see a gardener also lying there, killed while trimming the bushes, taking care of the hedges that surrounded the manor. The uh, the shears are still in his cold hands. Bon is going to work as hard as he can. He's going to use all of his energy to dig two shallow graves and bury both of these men and then head back inside and look for more of the family members. Which one do you go to first? Uh, He's going to go where he left his father. You go back to where you left your father and you see that um, his blood is still splattered and his handprint of blood is still stained upon that white wall. Um, but there's no evidence of him here. He's going to put his hand on that handprint and uh, just pause for a second. And then he's going to move on and he's going to look into his uh, parents' bedchamber to see if his mother is there and he's going to check each of his brother's rooms. Your mother's bedchamber is cold and empty. There is evidence of a crossbow on the ground with three bolts let loose. There is a man dressed in tattered clothing with paint on his face. Your would your mother's would-be attacker lies dead at the doorway with three bolts in his chest. Bon is going to pick him up, open the bedroom window, and throw him out. He lands with a thud, and you hear a rustle in the bushes and all quiet. He's going to look. He's going to stare at those bushes to see if he can see what made the noise. You may make a perception check. 17. 17. Good enough for you. You recognize a whistle, actually. The whistle of your order. Reminding you, it uh, sounds very much like one of the wild birds. Familiar to this area, except one of the notes is slightly off, indicating you that someone of your order The Order of the Clover Blade is on the property. He is going to uh, make the whistle back, and then he is going to run downstairs and uh, sneak towards those bushes, or he's going to open a window or a door to peek at those bushes and make the whistle again to see if the Order member would join him inside the manor. Are you trying to barge ahead or are you trying to be stealthy like a monk i'm trying to be stealthy i'm trying to yeah. i'm trying to find a stealthy place to call him to come join me inside where we could be a little bit more hidden and as you round the corner right before you enter into the backyard you feel very cold steel kind of whipping the backside of your rump you turn around and coffee the father of your order, is standing there with a sad smile on his face. And he greets you in the accustomed manner. How is that? He reaches out a hand to put it on my shoulder, but because he is superior to me, I bow lower and I extend a hand towards his knee. I don't grab his knee, but I just extend a hand towards his knee, kind of showing that uh, I'm I'm greeting him as well, but I'm greeting him at a much lower level because he is above me. Vaughn, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Come, and he lifts up your elbows and says, now is not the time for formalities. Greet me like you would greet your father. He just jumps into his arms, gives him a huge hug, starts to cry. And Kathy joins with you in this moment, bonding with you as the only family that you have left. And he says, there were beheadings last night. You would want to know that your brothers and your mother fell. Your father died here on the property, defending the home. They still beheaded his lifeless body as a tribute. I thank the gods for the rain because it put out their sultry fires, their sinful flames. There is time for revolution, but this is not the way. I have come back just to see 
if my family had survived. <laughs> you love your family and love has trumped reason, that is for sure. For there are assassins and bandits even looking for you. You were the only party member that were missed last night. And they made a point to put a high price on your head. 500 gold to bring the one and only heir of Steeplebottom Manor. Well, that is hardly relevant now. I am Vaughn, a monk of your order. Funny you should say that. I've been here for a while. I <laughs> had a feeling you'd return. I knew that you arrived at the Laughing Ghost Inn, but rather than trail you, I spent some time here thinking. I want you to ascend in the ranks of the Cloverblade. As of now, you are a hermit, lowest of our order, running errands back and forth. I want to call you a brother, but it requires you to disrobe yourself of your identity. And I do mean all of your identity. Vaughn, um, Vaughn simply bows in greeting like he did before, but instead of reaching towards his knee, he reaches towards his belt. And uh, that would be how a brother would greet a father mm -hmm. as opposed to a hermit. Mm -hmm. So he's acknowledging the promotion and rank. And he says, he says, I will disrobe my former self and identify only as Vaughn, a brother. A brother in the order of the clover blade. And Vaughn, because you spoke those words, and he looks around with absolute reverence, shiver goes down his spine. Still feels good to say that as as, as many times as I've said this before. <laughs> I never lose its wonder. Magic is all around us. Call it energy, power, key. Once you learn to empty yourself of who you think you are, then you become a vessel of that energy, a vessel of that power, ancient power. Not like elemental power that the gods use to craft the world, not like some prayer that establishes a relationship between worshiper and god. This magic is available to everyone, even the lowliest commoner, but it requires an empty vessel. You've already said you're willing to do this and the universe accepts no lies. As a father to a brother, and he smiles, I do wanna give you a piece of advice, not required, but the transition process can be much easier and much clearer if after you empty yourself completely and receive the energy of the universe, you identify with an ideal, a virtue that makes up who you are like you would a piece of clothing for not everyone can go around naked <laughs> monks we we do for a time but eventually we are mortal <laughs> strip yourself of your identity fine bond but do not go that way without clothing yourself with some kind of virtue for many monks have fallen many brothers of mine have fallen without securing themselves with some identity Please learn this way. Now, I have to return, but you are here for a reason. What can I do to help you? Well, I was looking for my brothers and my mother. I watched my father fall, and knowing that they have taken their bodies and beheaded them, I, I grieve that there is no burying their remains. So I will be satisfied with the two servants that I was able to bury. I must make one last stop inside the manor. Uh, I'm looking for my oldest brother's bow. I, I cannot use it now, but I have to believe that there will be a time that it will be beneficial to me or to my party. And although I am, I am changing my identity, I, I find that my father's longsword, my brother's bow, uh, will have greater purpose in my, in my life uh, beyond a 
the steeple bottom tradition. And so with your permission, Father, I will I will take that bow with me. Not my permission you need. I'm here to help you. Your, your family's tradition of hunting. Vaughn, please know it's very common for monks to not have personal ambition. But with the clover blade, there's always room for hunting. <laughs> Vaughn smiles. I will keep a lookout for you if you hear my call of warning. If you hear my call of warning, uh, take cover. Otherwise, I'll see you in another. I'll see you in another life, brother. Thank you. And he'll he'll uh, bow one more time, hand extended towards his belt, and then he'll disappear back into the manor. Vaughn's going to run up to his oldest brother's room, and he knows that there's a chest that uh, he kept the longbow in, and he may have pulled it out for the fight, but just in case he didn't, he's going to go check where his brother keeps this longbow and hope that it's there. Sadly, it is exactly where your brother left it, ready for your taking. He's going to pick up the longbow and the quiver and uh, sling them on his back, and he's going to robe up and hood up, and he's going to sneak back out the way he came doing his best to avoid any attention and and work his way back to the, uh, the inn. Hello, Sojourners. This is Jonathan. If you're a dungeon master and you've experienced burnout in your games, and you feel like you've lost your inspiration, I would encourage you to go to Sojourner's Awake and check out my Table Master course. It's a four-part series in which I sit with you one-on-one. -on -one. We review elements like world building, story design, and rules for the game, as well as finding out the secret spark that you love about playing Dungeons & Dragons. Quickly head over to www.sojournersawake.com and check it out. So our story continues. Where we find Sterling and Hawkins before this event occurs, the rain still falling, the creaking window, and the fire begins to snuff out. Hawkins and Sterling, what do we find you doing and what are you paying attention to? Hawkins, um, again, he's pretty much engrossed in this book. Um, unless something happens to, to grab his attention, he will at some point after maybe um about an hour he feels like he's getting a grasp on the things that he's reading and he'll pull out his tinker tool his tinkering tools and pull out that toy lion that he had um and and start to play around with it and sterling what do you find yourself doing what are you paying attention to so sterling um was uh, checking his supplies for the road um, they said it was going to be dangerous, so he was going over it once, twice, three times, just to make sure he had all his supplies. And then he keeps looking at it and can't remember why he only has half the supplies he's supposed to have. Um, but then he eventually settles down and sees that um, Hawkins is reading, and so he figures he will uh, start to uh, look at his book and then interrupt Hawkins and ask, Hey, can you start telling me that story? Um, uh, what, what? Oh, uh, you talking about the three gins and the lady? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's the one. It's, uh, I mean, it's a little fairy tale, um, that I, I sort of assumed everyone knew. I was surprised when you said you hadn't heard of the gins. Um, I don't know that any of this is true, but the story goes something like this. A lady goes to a dance with three, with the three gins and they all hate each other. And so she dances with each of them. She dances with the water, but finds that she can't breathe. She dances with fire, but it hurts to touch him. And she dances with earth, but he's really boring. And so she gets upset because she can't find anybody to dance with. And she goes and sits in a corner and writes her own song 
Now, nobody knows what that song sounds like anymore, they say. Uh, she gives it to the orchestra to play. And then um, she starts to, to dance to this song that she wrote. And uh, the djinns all see her you know, dancing beautifully in the middle of the floor. And they start to, to walk toward her. And, and she'll go to one and dance with one for a while and then leave and go to another and dance with another for a while and just back and forth between all three of them. And then um, they keep coming closer and closer to her as she's dancing around them. And uh, when the, the music is just reaching the climax, they all reach out to start to, to try to touch her. And instead she ducks down onto the floor and they all touch each other. And so the three gins kind of you know even each other out somewhat um and 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 she finds the lady finds that when all three of them come together there's a balance there that she kind of lacks and so they say that that's how bonzaro was born when the three gins touched each other and uh she liked this this place that she made so much that she decided to live there and she became the mother of all mankind. That's what they say anyways. And you see Sterling just looking at him with these big eyes, just like tear, just like, wow. He, you know, he's done a lot of study. He's very book smart, but this story is just touching a, a deep level in his, uh, in his soul. So he's just, thank, thank you for sharing that. That's amazing. And, and you said your parents told you this? They must be very smart people. Well, they are very smart, but this is just this is just the stories for children. I don't think there's any truth to it, really. Oh, oh, oh! I mean, it was still. Thank you. It was still very, very good. Sure. Sorry, with that, Stelling is gonna like go to his book. And as you pry open that very first page, Sterling, you hear the sound of a window breaking. Action station, Sterling's just ready. He's having flashbacks to um, what happened before. And he's just hand on his quarterstaff, ready to go. Hawkins, you turn around and the fireplace instantly snuffs out. Uh, that can't be good. He starts to, um, not a, it's not at all an instinct for him, but he starts to reach over for where his crossbow is on, you know, in his bag or strapped to his bag on the floor behind his, behind the bench he's sitting on. And as you stand up, the chair that Holith was sitting in starts to rock and then just falls over. Uh, did, did they say this place was haunted? Uh, somebody said something about ghosts, I think. Uh, do you want to you wanna come over here next to me? Yeah. yeah, that sounds good. I don't hear any laughing. Um, but okay. And as you say that, Sterling, you begin to hear laughing. <laughs> mm. There it is. Uh, well, this is strange. Um, uh, Halith? Halith? The room begins to be dark. Both of you make a wisdom saving throw. Is this a magical effect? Uh, no, it is not. 24. 13. Oh. 13 is the target. Okay, so out of the fireplace, you see a small blue flame. And eyes open up out of the flames into hollow darkness, and a tongue lops out where the face would be and, and just rolls out like a red carpet at your feet. And it, the etherealness touches your toe, Hawkins, and sends a strong shiver up your spine. However, Sterling and then Hawkins, you manage to resist this horrifying appearance. How do you do so? So Sterling is just, just um, he's used to seeing strange things pop out of strange corners from living under the water. So he's just utterly serene, just ready for anything. Um, so when he sees his tongue come out, he's just, he's ready. He's got his hand on his staff. He's got a friend with him this time. He feels good. Hawkins this, is, 
Go ahead. Hawk Hawkins <laughs> is at first terrified and then, you know, steals a glance to the side and sees that Sterling doesn't seem to be scared and he takes comfort in that. Both of you roll initiative, please. 16. Three. All right, Sterling, you're first. You indicated that you were ready and as you grip your quarterstaff tightly, you've heard of ghosts before and you know that this place was probably most likely haunted indeed. The apparition has made its appearance and it is attempting to frighten you, but you are ready for that. You are ready for this horrifying feature to send you running and screaming as it has done so many times before to many travelers. How do you respond in this situation? So as always, when Sterling faces these kind of dangers of um, creatures of the deep popping in front of his face, he reaches into his herbalism bag, grabs some uh, roots and, and just crushes them on his quarterstaff. And he feels power start flowing into that. And, and he, uh, he says that powerful word of with the power of the archer and he casts a lele on his quarterstaff um, and just goes to boop it on the nose with it. Just smack it in the face and see if it runs away. Okay. I'm proud you knew which, how to say shalele. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Strike he the ghost. A, he gets a 13. It's enough. Your staff moves through its horrible face. Max damage of 12. So Serene just, no, and hits it with the staff. It's Hawkins, you see the bravery of Sterling just rushing up into the fireplace and golf style, whacking the ghost's face before it emerges completely from the fireplace. And then it does. This horrible, like monstrous creature. Once once was a man, a woman, you cannot tell, but now its mouth just drops open and it screams loudly, this horrible shrill uh, sound all throughout the laughing ghost in. For it is no longer laughing, it is wailing. And Sterling, it retaliates against you with a withering touch. 21 to hit you. It's nine points of damage. Ooh. He's still up, but he's hit. Okay, so it just moves right through you, um, tearing through you, and you feel your body go just rigid with this energy and electricity and fire and water and earth and all these just your insides feel like they're turned inside out. And then the ghost just appears through the back of Sterling's bald head, Hawkins, and begins to look at you and move to possess you. How do you respond? Hawkins will raise his crossbow at it a little bit shaky and take a shot, making sure that Sterling's not, <laughs> not straight behind. <laughs> Ooh. He'll maybe take a side step. <laughs> okay, okay, so we'll see move to the side. Uh, 17 to hit. It does. Bolt just goes straight through the ghost. And six piercing damage. Okay. Is this a magical weapon? It is not. You watch as this bolt just goes straight through the ghost like a puff of steam. And it looks towards you to find out where you had gone. And it seems like it's having a hard time pinpointing your location. Anything um, else? Yeah, Hawkins will move. Seeing how Sterling was looked to be pretty well affected by that, um, he'll go try to stand in front of Sterling, just kind of on a whim. Uh, you mean further define what you mean by standing in front of Sterling? What's your intention? Get between the ghost and Sterling. Okay. You position yourself as this squat little gnome between this hulking of man <laughs> and it is now Sterling's turn. So Sterling is just shivering, holding himself. Um, he wasn't quite expecting that after hitting it on the nose, usually things ran away. Um, and so now he's really worried and he's just uh, takes some of those herbs that he had in his hand, starts chewing on them and casts cure wounds on himself um, to uh, make himself feel better. Sterling, having taken yourself out of the fight, you step back and receive vitality from these herbs. And uh, a pleasant taste erupts in your mouth. Peppermint. 
The ghost moves towards you, Hawkins. So I would like you to make a charisma saving throw as it attempts to enter into your corporal form. That is a 15. 15. It rushes into your body. And like before, it seemed to have like a uh, a location beam on where you were and it rushes in there and starts to form like a, a liquid caught in a blender but you have sidestepped moving out of the way just in the nick of time and the ghost just turns around at you and this giant hand moves up out of its body and you can see its black fingernails reaching down to scratch you but it is now your turn uh, seeing that the bolt had absolutely no effect on the ghost whatsoever hawkins will instead try to entangle it so that sterling can get a get a hit on it so he will um using the help action he will try to distract it to make sure that its arm stays in a position that it can't defend itself how do you do that you just like <laughs> sort of like he'll he'll move to uh, where that arm like the side of the ghost that the arm is coming out of and like try to swipe at it um, just to get its attention. Maybe even throw in some taunting too, like, <laughs> boo. <laughs> okay. That is the bottom. So Sterling, it is now your turn. So hearing those noises behind him, he grips his quarter staff even tighter, still with a little bit of those herbs in his hand, imbues it with mag magical energy and swings around again and tries to hit it. Um, advantage because I help. Yes. Sweet. Uh, he got 16. A hit. And he is doing five damage. Magical damage. Mm -hmm. It strikes through and you feel the, the, the pull and drag of your staff as it moves through this form. And you take the easy shot of just hitting that hand thinking any part of the ghost is a good hit. And this hand just poof, moves down just a little bit and it shrieks out in pain this time. But as it shrieks out in pain, you hear the ghost begin to flicker and fade and then resume the form of a man with long, a big old foppy head of hair and then resume back into this horrible visage of a ghost. It's gonna to look towards you, Sterling, having had a difficult time, maybe it had looks at your large bald head or your waving beard, or maybe just the pain of that strike sensing you as a powerful magic man, it tries to enter your body. Please make a charisma saving throw. Non-natural 20. You resist it. You seem to have quite a bit of knowledge about these ghosts. You were ready. You were able to withstand the horrible visage attack. You were able to stand the possession and you've struck it down twice doing damage to it. It looks frightened and terrified now, for you are indeed the apparition. You hear the sound of Vaughn approaching. Um, I would like to know what sounds you have been making during this time, assuming it's not a completely silent attack, although it's only been a couple seconds. Hawkins, oh, what has it been sounding like during this battle? <laughs> Um, so I think like there, there have been some chairs scooted out of the way as we've bumped into them and that sort of thing. And Hawkins, um, he's been talking to himself a little bit. Um, like after the bolt went through the ghost, he said, well, of course that wasn't going to work. What was I thinking? I gotta do better than that. Oh, and then, um, so he's, it's not loud, but he's been kind of muttering to himself all along and um, certainly some gasps as the ghost changes form that sort of thing. Um, Holith, Holith hears your cries out and he's stomping down the stairs and he sees it in, in, in like fashion. He also casts Shalele and begins to ward off the ghost back towards the fire pit. Get back ghost, get back! Vaughn, you are stepping through the door, entering the initiative at the top of the round. How would you respond to this situation? Vaughn would now he it looks like a ghost mm, that's he terrifying know, yeah he doesn't know anything about ghosts so assuming that he has the ability to do so he would run straight at it and swing his sword go ahead that's a natural 20. Mm -hmm. uh, 13 points 
of piercing damage if if that's a thing. It is not. So please take the reins, oh Vaughn, who charged a ghost first encounter. So Vaughn runs up seeing this enemy of his new friends, or who he perceives as his new friends, and he s- slams his sword through it and knows that he struck true and the sword just goes right through him and he he actually doesn't have any idea what to do but he is going to um he's going to swing he's going to swing a fist at it thinking okay well maybe a fist would work and that's uh 17 to hit for eight points of damage and that doesn't work either correct indeed it feels like your hand enters into an ice box so because he has uh the mobile feet he can still move and he can move without invoking an attack of opportunity so when he realizes his two attacks didn't work he's going to run back to hawkins and sterling and say what is that thing i hit it right it's a it's a ghost. I'd, I'd imagine what they named the inn after. What, what, what do we do? I've been hitting it with my staff, and it seems to do okay. Do it again. Indeed, Sterling, it is your turn. Top of round three. The ten. The ten. Mm-hmm. You go to swipe at it, and it moves with insane amounts of speed as it is trailing Vaughn at this time. Vaughn, it rushes up, squeezes between you and Sterling, and its face opens up into a large vacuum and moves to possess you. Please make a charisma saving throw. Oh, good times. 14. You succeed. (laughs) It starts to enter into you, but you are able to shake it off. It wails in agony as it is completely failed. What does that appear like with Vaughn? Vaughn turns around to speak to his friends and the ghost is upon him and is clearly trying to enter him. And as Vaughn feels its presence trying to enter his body, he remembers what uh, what his uh, his mentor said and uh, starts to center and empty himself and think about the things that he knows are true and right. And uh, he finds this, he finds this power inside of him that uh, just reflects and uh, rejects the presence of this ghost. And, uh, and, he, and he feels kind of like a trampoline. He just kind of feels it start to enter and then get bounced right back out. And it does, and it goes straight for the fireplace and pinballs against it. And at that moment, Holith delivers a firebolt that whoosh, lights up the fire again, and you hear the shrieking sounds of the ghost slowly echo and disappear and get fa- softer and, and fade away. And the chair that was once knocked over just suddenly m- magically stands aright. Though the window is broken, the fire is now lit, and the rest of you huffing and puffing. Wow, you came just in time, Vaughn. And, and you too, Holaf, thank you. Yeah, don't mention it. I thought Laughing Ghost Inn was just a euphemism. I had no idea this place actually contained a ghost. That's quite disheartening. I, I know I struck it true twice, and it seemed to have no effect. Well, uh, Sterling, you, you were able to, t- to take it down a little bit. I saw it shrieking at you. Yeah, I wasn't. A laughing matter, you could say, but uh, I just did what I do. I, I hit it on the nose with the staff. But uh, yeah, I was pretty proud of those good hits. Hawkins and Vaughn, you see that Sterling seemed to have handled himself quite well with no experience with apparitions, specters, or the world beyond. How would you respond to Sterling's deafness in handling this situation? Hey, you know, Sterling, I think we make a pretty good team. I mean, you know, we got hurt a little bit, but we took care of that thing, you and me. 
Yeah, much better than my earlier uh, encounter when I was fighting. It definitely helps to have, hey, that was a good move that, you know, distracting it so I could get a good hit on it. I, that was that was, that was was good. And thanks for giving me a chance to catch my breath. It, it, it did, did some, that was awkward when it went through me like that. It didn't look too good. Oh, it was so cold. Sterling, there is a small little remnant of the ghost still attached to your beard. And as it flutters away like a butterfly, you just hear the word whispered, ball top, ball top. Vaughn and Hawkins, you hear the echo and the wisp of ghost flutters into the, the fireplace and pff, fizzles out and you hear echoing ball top, ball top. Sterling, I must know why your weapon worked against that and why it was living in your beard and why it all talked to you. What is going on? Your guess is as good as mine, friend. I, I think I think it means it's time to go. And, and it, it worked because I, I, I don't know, I was able to put some energy, a little, little focus into the staff and it doesn't become a regular weapon. It has a little extra a little extra aura to it. Um, it's something that I, I've been shown. I didn't know if I could use it, but it, it came out and, and it was effective. Holith gives a big eye roll, puts his hand on Sterling, Sterling's hulking shoulder and says, the point is Sterling, like many of us, doesn't tell you everything all at once. I can relate. And you get the impression that Holith is not completely being honest with you about everything involved. And he does say, it probably seems like it is a good time in case the ghost decides to come back for seconds. I have not been attempted to be possessed and I don't really want to try. I need to know a little more about how the two of you were able to hurt that ghost. I am, no offense, but I am well-trained and, and I attack strongly and I had no effect on that. And if this is what it's going to be like, I fear that I might not be beneficial to you. Well, I mean, there are things out in the wild that have flesh and blood, but I do apologize, but unless you have some way to access the arcane energy of the universe, <laughs> I mean, the, <laughs> the ghost, it wasn't really here. It was just a, I mean, it looked like to me like a, projection of our imagination and we were just simply responding to it. I don't really know that much about ghosts, but lucky for you, you're going to a library and you have plenty of time to learn if that's so interests you. I will learn about the arcane energy then because I do not like feeling help less helpless and, and not beneficial. As the day progresses on, Holith seeming eager to leave at this moment with his bags packed. You indeed progress on your way to Bald Top Library. As you're traveling along the road, the sun begins to set. The wilderness presses on against your safety and you leave the countryside of Boshan. You recognize the forests are growing thicker. The clouds seem heavier and the animals less inclined to approach you as they skirt away from the, the approaching civilization, as it were. You notice Holith moving in and out of the shadows, trying to track the best route, but every once in a while he puts his ear to the ground and shakes his head and looks off in the distance, one, two, three directions, shrugs his shoulders and continues to move on ahead of you, leading the way. The dimly lit sky begins to sap the hope from the stalwart of souls. In the distance, you can see the glittering glow of Boshan, yet aflame again, for night is beginning to fall. And as the sun has disappeared over the horizon, Hawkins, you're experiencing a sense, a very positive smell what is that? Hawkins is riding on the back of the steel defender and um, 
he's trying his best while in the fading sunlight to continue reading uh, the book and um, just right right around the time that he decides that he it's it's too dark for him to read um, the steel defender springs a little leak and some oil shoots out onto his onto his pants and so he can smell that um, and that's a very like even though it's annoying that now he's going to have to get down and work on this thing a little, for a little bit at least it gives him something to do something to keep his mind off the off the dread off the night um, and that you know familiar machine smell brings some small comfort to him steel defender comes to a halt and holleth looks around and says ah, as good as a place as any i suppose vaughn and sterling you're watching as hawkins is taking the time with the oil and the steel defender where was that earlier we could we could have used this to fight that ghost oh oh you know what i didn't even think of that that's ah, i'm sorry what's what's that stuff coming out of it is is it blood it, well uh not exactly it's it's all um that yeah it's not it's it's kind of like blood for a machine it helps all the parts to keep moving it smells fine yeah i love that smell don't you sterling you're interrupted by a positive sight you're in the wild so you see Sterling like a little boy just ooh, stops everything and just runs off into a patch of woods and finds a little herb that he read about in a book but never actually seen on um, being on land for the first time. And so he's just like looking at it, pulling it up, holding it to the light, measuring it, and then you see him just put it into his little pouch and uh, he's quite satisfied with himself. Vaughn, you notice Sterling disappear off skirting away into a patch of brush. Vaughn's going to stay with the party, but he's going to keep both eyes on Sterling. So back close to the party, but he's keeping an eye on Sterling and ready to pursue if there's an issue or if he's chasing danger. And you were interrupted with a positive sound. What is that? So Vaughn Vaughn's time at the monastery was, uh, there was quite a bit of time where he was, he, where he would spend uh, time by himself in isolation, out in the woods, in silence and meditation. And when Sterling goes running off into the bushes, uh, he hears the scattering of animals. Uh, you know, just a couple little animals that were in the bushes, uh, maybe a couple rabbits took off one direction and and uh, some lizards the other direction. But uh, hearing the animals scurry through the, the forest just for a second uh, helped him remember a time that was very peaceful and um, uh, just a very monumental time in his life uh, growing and learning at the monastery. And so he was transported back there very briefly and, uh, and very excited to hear that sound. And even though Holith is leading you all, he begins to settle down for the night and takes a very unconcerned approach with speaking to you that evening, making a strong assumption that in the morning time, we will simply pick up where we left off. Out here in the wild, you begin to hear the howls of wolves, the hoots of goblins and the shrills of banshees suddenly realize you are no longer in the safety of Boshan, though what's it safe to begin with? No longer in the protection of the Laughing Ghost Inn, but after the encounter with the, with the apparition, how would you be bedding down for the night? Vaughn is okay with the wild animals, with the wolves and such. He's, that's not as scary for him, but when he hears, when he hears what he can't understand uh, or what he's not familiar with and when he's told that that's a banshee and when it's explained to him that the banshee is similar to the ghost um, he's he's unnerved and uh, he is going to spend a large part of the beginning of the evening with his longbow uh, practicing at a tree nearby uh, just 
preparing for maybe a morning hunt for breakfast or uh, just picking up those skills, uh, thinking about his brother and how excellent his brother was with the bow and how many hunts they went on together where he would chase the prey after his brother would hit it with an arrow and the teamwork that they did together. But, uh, but mostly practicing and keeping a sharp ear out for which direction he's hearing noises that he's not familiar with. And, uh, and then when it comes time for rest, uh, uh, I don't know how well he's going to rest tonight. So Sterling's found himself a clearing in the, um, in the trees and he's just laying down He's at pace. He doesn't mind the sounds, doesn't mind the noises. He's just looking up. He's captivated um, by these stars uh, away from the city and any distraction of any lights. And he is just looking at all these stars, seeing shooting stars, just like tracing the constellations in his brain. He is at home, comfortable. Every so often he'll hold up his sea glass to just kind of look through it and see if he sees anything different. Um, but. Uh, he keeps doing that until the rest takes his eyes. Vaughn, go ahead and make a constitution saving throw. That's going to be a 12. You're going to have a fitful night of sleep, unable to find comfort here in the wild. Sterling, you were able to sleep through the night and it is Hawkins who's interrupted by the sound of wood snapping. A nearby tree trunk that you had positioned yourself begins to grow and slither around your leg. You respond. Uh, guys. Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. It's, it's, sit, it's, stop. Red Bark, still, it's okay. He's one of our friends. Uh, excuse me, and you see the most beautiful woman clothed in the raiment of the forest her skin green and brown and shimmering with glitter in the moonlight. Her hair is wild and unkept and almost appears as if it is standing straight up like branches of a tree. She kneels down and says, uh, hi, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm Trina. Y you are sleeping in his bedroom. She looks up at this very large redwood tree and she pats it affectionately. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I can move to another tree, he says, wiping his eyes. No, it's okay, okay, okay. You are far from home, you and your two companions. What are you doing out here in the wild? Something clicks in his brain. My two companions? I was, I was here with three others. Oh, well... Uh, I only see two at the moment. Are you are you lost? No, we're on our way. Uh, I think one of these guys knows where we're going. At least I hope he does, because I sure don't have a clue. Ooh, what's that? And she points her finger towards your mechanical lion, and her fingernail begins to grow and twirl like a vine grasping for an item. Oh, oh what is... Yeah, what is that? Hawkins sort of snatches it away from her and says, "This is this is my um, kind of a kind of a toy that I've been building for a while." Oh, and as you snatched away, the twig on her fingernail breaks and snaps. Oh, that hurts. Oh, I'm I'm sorry, ma'am. Ow! Do you have any medicine or anything? I don't. Um, I think. I think, and he'll stand up and start to walk over toward Sterling. I think he has some. Oh, let's go find out. Hawkins will sort of kick Sterling awake. Uh, yes. Sterling, standing over you are two very large sculpted legs, appearing like tree bark growing to right about her kneecap in which her skin is green and brown, covered by a leaf and forest branch dress. She squats down and looks at you square in the eyes and says, hello, and on her breath is the breath of the fall and autumn leaves. Sterling's just looking at her eyes. Well, you're new. Do you have any medicine? Your friend here bit me on the finger. 
Oh, oh yes, I have herbs and I have some 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 good healing. Yes, she backs up herbs. Why would oh, you imprison uh, such creatures? Well, um, you see, they they help me. These creatures, they 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 give me healing. Uh, w- w- what is wrong? What ails you? You are a druid, are you not? Oh, I, I've not been called that, but are you uh, are you a good druid or a bad druid? I'm so so. I mean, I think I'm good. Roll a persuasion check. <laughs> That's a six. <laughs> okay. Ugh. Any medicine from him won't do. Where's your other friend? Did, ooh, and she looks over at Vaughn, who is having a fitful night. Vaughn, what does she see? Vaughn is trying to sleep, and he just keeps rolling over side to side, and uh, he's not sleeping well. So when he hears Sterling start to talk, he opens his eyes. And so by the time she looks over his way, he's sitting there wide-eyed, trying to figure out in his mind if she's real or if she's a ghost. And uh, he's got his hand on his sword, and he's just watching this transaction since Hawkins doesn't seem concerned. Uh, he's, he's just watching. Uh, she looks over at you and she tries to get a little closer and then she gets pulled back almost as she's been caught on a leash. And she says, it's okay, it's okay. And she points back to the tree and says, let me go. They're all right, they're not gonna hurt us. And she steps forward and looks and says, your friend bit my finger and your other friend kills herbs for a living. Do you have any medicine or are you an evil person? I'm not an evil person. I can take a look at your injury and see if I can help. Oh, you're nice. He's willing to do a medicine (laughs) check on her. Oh, do a medicine check on me. Yes, please. And she spreads out her, her body and her arms and waits for the doctor. Where are you injured? my heart and you must make a wisdom saving throw my friend Uh, that's going to be a nine you find yourself charmed by this beautiful dryad whether it be her pet tree her connection to the forest or her need for help you find that you regard her as a trusted friend to be heeded and protected Although you are not under her control, you take her requests and actions in the most favorable way possible as you continue your medicine check. So Vaughn Vaughn asks her that question, and then when she says, my heart, and spreads her arms open, he's going to put his hand where he believes her heart would be and do a medicine check like he's really going to try to heal her heart. (laughs) But he rolled a six. Okay. And she laughs and says, no, I don't have a heart. I'm not a silly person. And she looks down and says, but neither are they. She squats down at your level, Hawkins. And then she looks up at Sterling and stands up to Sterling's level. And then finally just makes eyes with you, Vaughn, and says, this is not a safe place. My name is Trina. And you can't do what I do. And then she does it. She disappears, and then you see her face embedded, embossed in the red tree. And she puts her finger up to her lips and says, I'm hiding. And then she pops up and grows through the ground and says, I can move through the trees, but you won't be able to outrun them, and you're not in a safe place. They're coming. Where do we go, Trina? Oh, I can help you. Well... You're mortal. I don't think you'll fit. I can take one of you at a time, but the fey wolves are coming. They sprout up out of the mushrooms in the nighttime when travelers come through. And as they sprout up, they devour, take you back to the land of dreams and fairies. You don't want to be eaten, do you? I do not. Hawkins and Sterling, you are watching this interchange and you can clearly see that Vaughn is infatuated with this creature. And she seems to be telling the truth as far as you can tell. 
about the dangers of this area and possibly even Sterling. And I would say Hawkins, because of your gnomish ancestry, there is something very unsettling about the ground you're sitting upon. Hawkins, how do you respond? When um, things get kind of weird between Trina and Vaughn, Hawkins will start backing toward his supplies, um, ready to, you know, throw his things on his back and start to run if that's what's going to happen. And Stelling's looking at his herb pouch, just kind of wondering if they're really trapped in there and like thinking to himself, kind of, are these, are these really alive? Like, uh, and that's, that's where his curiosity is. Okay. Uh, she, in, she implores you, Vaughn, says, please, please, uh, you're very kind and you're a doctor and we need doctors in the world, especially to go back and forth and we could be friends. Um, I could take you through the trees, safely through the forest and get you on the other side, wherever you're going, it's fine. And the fairy wolves won't have a chance to eat you. I will try to bring your friends, although the one that captures herbs for a living, I'm not sure if I want to bring him, but if you're very nice and you provide me what I want, it's just a small thing, just a simple token to pay for the price of travel, especially since I have to bring your friends. Would you give it to me? I would like to. What is it? A kiss. Vaughn, I, I wouldn't do that. Oh, but she's very nice, Hawkins, and she's going to help us out of the forest. Vaughn, I, I think you need to, to take a step away from her for a minute. The clock ticks one. Oh, so um, after he's just been distracted by the herbs, he's um, going to think about what she is and kind of pay attention to his... Uh, surroundings and he wants to kind of roll a check to see what he uh, knows about this because he had fey wolves and he was like well, that doesn't sound quite right like once he stopped looking at his herbs the clock ticks too and yes you may make a perception check to gather your general surroundings sterling can i do a nature check uh does it matter it's a 19 it's a 19 yeah um 19 plus what Go ahead and do a nature check. Uh, so with, with that, she's more with perception. It's 23 with perception. Yeah, there's something very funny about these mushrooms. And they weren't here when you laid down, but the mushrooms have now gathered into a concentric circle conveniently around all three of you. It seems as if the mushrooms have been slowly marching over the night and forming a perfect circle around your camp. Vaughn is ready to give her a kiss and go into the tree. That's three. So, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Vaughn says, I will, yes, I will give you a kiss if you can take me and I would really like you to bring my friends through the tree. She stops and begins to sob, uh, tearfully begins to pout and cry. And she says, you're serious. Am I still charmed? Yes. She begins to hold your hand and lead you straight towards the tree. And right as her back is up against the red tree, she puts out her lips, her jaw drops, and she waits for Vaughn to kiss her. Sterling would grab him at this point after seeing the mushrooms and say, Vaughn, we've got to go to Bald Top. How do we get to Bald Top? She says, I, oh, you're going to Bald Top. I can take you to Bald Top. I'll take you to the other side. It's just right through this tree. She looks over at Sterling and says, it's just a kiss She's gonna from a very nice doctor. doctor. Yes, from a very nice doctor. I'll take you to Bald Top, it's fine. I'll even take your bald friend and your short little friend too. I don't think we should be kissing any trees. Uh, where's Howlett? I, I haven't seen him. Have you seen our fourth friend, uh, Trina? No, but if your fourth friend wants to come too, you've been so kind. I would gladly take your fourth friend as well. Uh, we really should hurry, they're coming, they're coming. And Sterling and Hawkins, you now see that some of the mushrooms have indeed growing and one of them has nearly sprouted a leg. Its roots are beginning to come undone. They're pressing in around you. Um, Hawkins, you're having to pull your supplies because the mushrooms have infringed upon your sleeping arrangement. Vaughn's gonna run and grab his stuff and then he's gonna come back over and, and give her a kiss. 
Okay, so she's running alongside with you hand in hand. This fairy woman is just giddy and she almost floats out of the ground. And she says, it's happening, it's happening. And Selim was <laughs> gonna try and tackle him and take him out of the out of the ring. All right, let's Sorry. roll a, um, it's gonna be a very difficult wisdom check. Just straight wisdom. For me? Yeah, you're, you're, you're trying to compete against her and um, I will have her roll as well. Uh, okay. I got a three. I you got a three? A, a three, I okay. Three. She got an eight. Ah! Okay. <laughs> it's too late, Sterling. She and Vaughn kiss and disappear into the tree. Hawkins just snatches up his bag and says, Sterling, let's go! And he starts sprinting. And at that moment, Hawkins, a wolf, rushes out of the mushroom and snaps towards your arm. Please make a dexterity saving throw. Uh, six, uh, 18. 18, three points of slashing damage to you. The wolf slashes at your arm, leaving a trail of blood. And it, with one hind, or with two front legs, it pulls itself out of the mushroom and you can see its fur is bristling with bright rainbow colors. And its saliva that lingers on your arm is full of honey and wine. Sterling, another one pops up out of the ground and it begins to chant, but not the howls that you heard earlier. Instead, it's this very seductive, charming melody that tickles your ears drawing you ever so closely to the rest of the pack that are building up around one by one. These fairy wolves pop out of the mushroom and look left and right for a mortal soul to devour. Sterling, how do you respond? Sterling here and Hawkins, uh, call for him would start running towards Hawkins. Okay, Hawkins, what do you do? Uh, take off in the direction that we were going, that Haleth last, last was leading us. Uh, okay, you are surrounded by the wolves. Indeed, oh, okay. you decide to go through them. The forest at your back, the path that you were following is blocked at this moment. Yeah, so I think he will attempt to run through them. Yikes. <laughs> okay. uh, you were charging through the wolves. Sterling, do you follow him? One second. Um, so with uh, with um, Hawkins running and he's noticing that the wolves are all standing there. Sterling's gonna take out his water skin, dump some water, turn it into ice, and throw it like a knife at the wolves. Okay. All right, so uh, with Vaughn once again out of the picture, <laughs> I need Hawkins and Sterling to roll initiative. <laughs> Do I get my surprise round? With the ice knife? No, 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 no. All right, it's 12. 18. All right, the wolf, the wolves, there are four of them in combat to represent the horde. Hawkins, they look vicious. Uh, the four of them, <laughs> they get their pack tactics. Um, they're going to make an attack against you. Uh, plus four to hit. A 19. Hits. 12. Uh, that meets because he's not wearing his armor. Oof, yikes. Oh, okay. Uh, four points of piercing damage. Okay. Yeah, small, that was, a, that was a small roll. You skid to a stop and the wolf snaps at you, snapping at you, uh, tearing into you. The other two have not yet attacked and they lean towards Sterling. Sterling, they make the attacks against you. Uh, 13 and a 22, both hit. Same damage, I rolled a one again, four points of damage to you. The wolves then press in closer, one by one stomping. Hawkins and Sterling, you are shoulder to shoulder with Haleth nowhere in sight, with Vaughn nowhere in sight. You feel that pressing, pounding in your chest. Could this be your last stand? Together, Sterling, at least you're not alone, for you have a small man at your side 
with his finger on the trigger of a crossbow and a steel defender, stomp, 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 activates and takes up a defensive position. Hawkins, any attack against you has a reaction disadvantage, much like a warding flare. The steel defender activates and says, protect, protect, protect. And Vaughn, you feel a sudden rush, weightlessness, an incredible speed. And you nearly become nauseous as you are moving through a rapid speed. Indeed, one, boom, boom. You feel this vacuum just moving back and forth, oh, one after the other, moving at a lightning speed and suddenly becomes aware to you that you're moving through the trees. And you hear the voice of Trina finally catching up to you, laughing and giggling, and your body is just moving at a lightning speed through the trees one at a time. Can't tell how fast you're moving, but you almost feel sick to your stomach as you are moving through the tree, the stride of the trees. <laughs> and as Vaughn is taking all this in, you feel the tight grip of Trina's hand are on yours. Still being charmed. How do you how do you in how do you resolve this situation? If we're still moving fast through the trees and we're holding hands, Vaughn would be communicating something like Whoa, we're we're going really fast. I this is kind of scary, but uh, when will we get there? And then you stop suddenly and she says, oh, I'm sorry. I, I've been told I take things way too fast. I'm so sorry. We can take it slower. She grins and you find yourself alone on the other side of the forest, stepping out of a very large red tree. Well, we made it. Oh, do you want me to go back and get your friends? Yes, please. I'll wait oh. here for you. Okay, bye. And poof, she disappears into the red tree and you were left alone in the forest. Sword drawn uh, back to the tree or a different tree, back to a different tree looking at the red tree. Mm-hmm. Squirrel sits up, uh, sorry, a, uh, an owl stands at attention at a branch above you and looks down at you, cocking its eyes, staring into your heart and your soul. The only creature in the middle of the night. Minutes go by, still no Trina. Vaughn would make owl noises back to it just to kind of feel like they're friendly. And the owl flutters away into the night. You hear the screeching of a mouse caught in its talons. You see the silhouette of the very large horned owl in the moonlight, and it disappears into its home. And so for now, our story concludes. This has been a production of Sojourners Awake, the bookish and the brave. Please continue to follow along to find out what happens to Vaughn, Hawkins, and Sterling. Will this be their last stand? Will they make it through the forest and eventually arrive to Bald Top Library? Thanks again to Tabletop Audio for their wonderful background music and ambiance. You can support them at www.tabletopaudio.com. If you would like more Dungeon Master resources, visit Sojourners Awake at www.sojournersawake.com. May your story continue.